Hi, my name is George Hobach. Welcome to my new talk about Einstein's true legacy, which is local symmetry, and local symmetry means sameness. Einstein was able to demonstrate that the local laws of nature are the same everywhere and all the time, and by doing so he was also able to demonstrate that local symmetry is nature's core principle, and nature, of course, is the cosmos. And right away I want to give you a quote from Leon Liedermann and Christopher Hill. They are both physicists. Liedermann is a Nobel Prize laureate. And in their book, Symmetry in the Beautiful Universe, they explain why it is important that everybody studies local symmetry. They write, The perspectives offered by symmetry, it is imperative that we try to give the non-scientific members of society who, through democratic processes, make the final decisions, a better understanding of the key issues. In fact, our future depends on it. <clears throat> and then they go on to say in their book that really everybody should study it, beginning uh, with children in kindergarten all the way up through high school, college, into your professional life. And today I want to focus on the concept of the void and spirituality and explore how this is underpinned and created by local symmetry. So let's first uh, take a closer look at the local symmetry concept. At the center you will find the equal sign and this tells you right away that local symmetry is purely mathematical. I put these two uh, magnets on either side of the equal sign to illustrate what uh, local symmetry is. These two magnets are identical, they are the same, they are symmetric. And sameness really is the first level of local symmetry. It gives us stability and it is a level that is space and time independent because it represents sameness no matter where you are or at what moment uh, in time. And since this is mathematical, you can also label these two magnets, the first and the second. And you can remove these two material objects and then you're really left with just this uh, purely mathematical structure. It's a, an equation. It tells you that the first is equal to the second, or 1 equals 2. And this takes us to the second level of local symmetry, which is that of a dynamic relationship, because you can move back and forth between these two numbers. Since this is the central principle uh, of nature, which underpins and creates everything, you can imagine that there's a lot of data compression involved. And so this uh, short code here may not mean to you a lot. So we have to be able to open it up to read it like a book. And uh, we can derive properties because they are encoded in the structure here. And when we derive these properties, we better understand what this all entails. And to get to these properties, we will relate the numbers to each other. So let's start with this. We relate number one to number two, and we will find that number one in relation to number two represents the, sm the smaller number. It's the smallest whole integer number. So number one represents the concept of being small. And small means also that you're local because you're confined to a small region of space. And this then explains why symmetry is local and why the laws of nature are local as well, because the laws of nature are also uh, relationship concepts. And we have this sequence here, this order, number one comes first and number one represents small. So this is really a primary and a central aspect of local, of symmetry and therefore it is local. Okay, so local, uh, small means local, small also means concentration. Concentration is the same as the concept of a unit or unity. And uh, in mathematical terms, you can call this number one property space added up. If you move over to the right hand side, uh, number one is located here, and number one related to number, and uh, number two related to number one tells us that number two is the larger number, and uh, the mathematical equivalent for this is the concept of additionality. Additionality does not have any limits, so it represents infinity. Infinity is open. It is open like the future and it is open like something mysterious because you cannot pin a number on it. Um, in colloquial language, this here is more. The word more represents this and more also means that there is action involved. 
and um, consequently more means energy because energy is the ability to do work and when you do work you do more. More also means counting like one marker, one more marker, one more. So one, two, three. And of course energy is also creativity because you're able to do something and since this number two property space is the part of the equation that relates back to the beginning to number one the concept of the return is placed here as well as the mathematical equivalent for that which is adding up and so you you have been introduced to a couple of ideas of, of properties that are encoded in this local symmetry um, scheme here and now we want to move over to discuss features of the void and one of the features here is of course that uh, the void is empty and that it represents nothingness and I want to give you a quote from a book it's called a universe from nothing and it was written by Lawrence Grouse a physicist and he says nothing in this case no time no space is unstable now where does this come from as I explained before here on the right hand side in the property space of number two we have infinity located and infinity can see itself as part of this unity concept here so in essentially infinity can get integrated into unity and unity is then like the center here of the whiteboard you cannot see any differences anymore and when you cannot see any differences um, it looks empty so it looks like there's nothing there so we can understand what the void is and since uh, the void or unity contains this more concept here uh, and more means more than certain or more than being precise or in other words it's uncertainty and uncertainty is this, uh, the central principle of quantum mechanics you can understand that this unity, this nothingness is like a cross set unstable and out of this unity energy can emerge so we can understand why physicists say the void is empty and represents nothingness the next feature is that of simplicity and I want to give you a quote again it's by physicist David Tong from his uh, lecture quantum fields the real building blocks of the universe and Tong says so this is nothing this is the simplest thing we can imagine in the entire universe and it is complicated now it's easy to see where simplicity comes from the local symmetry concept is a statement of wholeness of unity that even includes infinity and this is really where the complexity comes from because infinity is open and you cannot really put a lid on it so we can understand why the void is simple and complex at the same time and it's also symmetric I want to give you one more quote it's by K KC Cole she is a science writer and the quote is from her book The Universe and the Teacup The Mathematics of Truth and Beauty and she says perhaps the most symmetrical thing of all is nothing and we can understand why because um, everything which is the infinity aspect here is integrated into this uniform concept of unity and then you cannot see any differences as I said and this is a statement of very uh, fundamental symmetry however I want to point out since everything is uh, underpinned and created by local symmetry even the visible universe um, everything even as I said the, the universe that we can see with our senses is uh, totally symmetric and now I want to give you a quote by Isaac Newton because he very nicely sums up uh, this this big picture of, of local symmetry and this also in a way leads us towards spirituality this quote is uh, from the book Newton's Gift by Daniel Berlinski and Newton says this most beautiful system of the sun planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and domination of an intelligent and powerful being now intelligence comes from the fact that these two aspects here due to the equal sign are aware of each other so this represents uh, in a, a consciousness that includes infinity so it's a very powerful awareness
He is eternal and infinite, omnipotent and omniscient. That is, his duration reaches from eternity to eternity, his presence from infinity to infinity. Eternity refers to this aspect of sameness, which is, as I said, time and space independent. He governs all things and knows all things that can be done, refers to infinity. He is utterly void of all body and bodily figure. Again, what this means is you have the infinity term here on the right hand side. And as I said, it can get integrated into this unity concept. It's like a curtain of unity, a veil, uh, and you cannot see behind this. This is why it looks immaterial and empty or it's, uh, it doesn't have a bodily figure. We have ideas of his attributes. That's what we've been talking about here and here. But what the real substance of anything is, we know not. We know him only by his most wise in excellent contrivance of things. Okay, the mystery is always there because of infinity. So let's move on to the next feature, with, which is that the void is a reservoir of energy. And this comes from Lisa Randall. She's a physicist and she wrote this in her book, War Passages. And she says, you can think of the vacuum as a reservoir of energy. And this should be easy to understand now because on the right hand side in this property space we have energy. The energy can be integrated in a way that it uh, is part of this unity concept and then this is equal to, be, to being empty or nothing. And we can move on to the next concept. This is very interesting. It's the concept of a grid. And this quote comes from Frank Wilczek, also a physicist of course, a Nobel Prize laureate. And it's from his book, The Lightness of Being. And he says, a great lesson is that the entity which, the entity we perceive as empty space is in reality a dynamic medium full of structure and activity, the grid as we have called it. And the grid refers to the fact that there can be um, seen a metric field in, in this concept of empty space. And we can ex understand this because on the right hand side we have the more term, the infinity term, and on this side we have the unity or unit aspect. And um, so we can have many different units, but the uh, sameness level, which is space and time independent, guarantees that these units are stable. So you can understand that everybody, every local observer has like a ruler and everybody has the same one. And we also have the same time and we have the same relationship between space and time. And um, to make this grid work, it is important again that we have this aspect of being local as the first aspect. Because in, in previous uh, talks I explained that, that uh, space-time is malleable. It can be stretched or it can be compressed. And um, But nonetheless you have to have a uh, as, uh, as uh, what you can call a ruler or a, a clock that is always the same. And this only works uh, when you understand that local is central and then all the adjustments in space-time are done in a way that this relationship between space, the metric of space and time is the same. So everybody can, for instance, measure that the, uh, the speed of light is constant. So this is a really cool aspect about empty space. And we can move on to the next one. And I will give you a quote again. The next feature is the sum of all possibilities. And I want to quote Brian Cox and Chef Forshaw. These are two physicists from Great Britain. And they have written a book called The Quantum Universe. And in it they say the following. Because we live in a quantum universe, the correct thing to do is to add all the possibilities together. The vacuum, in other words, has an incredibly rich structure made up out of all possible ways that particles can pop in and out of existence. Here on the right hand side we have the infinity term. We also have this math mathematical notion of adding up. And again you can take infinity and integrate it into unity and then uh, you get exactly that feature which I just explained the sum of all possibilities. 
and we can move on to the next central feature and this feature is called the law. I first want to give you a quote by Henri Poincaré. He's a mathematician. He was a contemporary of Einstein and he wrote a book, The Foundations of Science. And he's, in this book he says, the internal harmony of the world is, we shall see, the only true objective reality. The best expression of this harmony is law. We should be astonished at nature's regularity. The world is divine because it has harmony. And Poincaré was also aware of the fact that nature's central principle is harmony and harmony, of course, is local symmetry. And we can go on and um, I will give you a quote by Albert Einstein from his book Relativity and the Problem of Space. In it, Einstein says, if one thinks the gravitational field to be taken away, then what remains is nothing at all. So what Einstein is saying, if you take a central phenomena of uh, space-time away, like gravity, which is equivalent to adding up on the large scale, you will actually take away everything because everything, all these different aspects are interconnected, so you cannot take one aspect away because uh, the others will go, go along. And of course, since this is a holistic uh, statement here, you cannot remove anything and f throw it away. It has to stay uh, or has to be or remain part of this uh, wholeness concept. And so again, what you can do, you can integrate it into this unity concept and then it's like hidden away and nothing is left. So that's what we uh, can learn from Einstein. And then Robert Laughlin is also a physicist, a Nobel Prize laureate. Uh, he wrote a book, A Different Universe, Reinventing Physics from the Bottom Down, and in it he says the following, Moreover, the preemptive ability of matter requires the organizational principles at work there to be the same as those at work in the vacuum, since otherwise the effects would be miracles. So what does he tell us? Um, he's telling us that uh, the visible universe, which consists of... Uh, material objects tells us that that mass or energy can self-organize into these material massive objects and he says that these material or these organizational principles they cannot just spring into existence like this they have to be present already otherwise you cannot understand why they are there and from what we've been discussing we know that everything that is part of the visible world can be hidden away into this concept of nothingness. So these laws and or organizational principles uh, exist really on a time and space independent level of sameness. And so we can understand why nothingness can be, can be understood as a law because it's identical with the central principle of nature, local symmetry that is. The next cool feature of the void is information. And I want to give you a quote by John Wheeler, of course a physicist, and it's from his lecture Information, Physics, Quantum, the Search for Links. And in it he says, it from bit. It from bit symbolizes the idea that every item of the physical world has at bottom, at a very deep bottom, in most instances, an immaterial source and explanation. Now if you take a look at the local symmetry scheme here, you will see that uh, symmetry consists of two aspects that are united into one whole, into one unit. And this is exactly how the core of information is defined. The bit, the core of information, consists of two bit values. So we can understand that the central, central principle of nature, of the cosmos, local symmetry, is the same as the core definition of information. And we've already discussed that this whole principle can understand itself as immaterial, as not uh, being or existing. It is then nothing or empty. So we can also understand why the explanations that we get for everything are uh, based in nothingness, which is of course always local symmetry. And uh, I just want to tell you this, another famous physicist from Austria, Anton Seilinger, in his book, is the German title, Einstein's book, 
He also says information is the fundamental ingredient of the universe. We can agree with that. Uh, Seth Lloyd from MIT. He is a uh, leader in quantum computer uh, development. In his book Programming the Universe, he also talks about the fact that uh, information is central and that uh, info, that the universe can emerge from nothingness and this is uh, equivalent to saying that there is no information at the beginning of all and I've just explained to you how this can be. And there's also a German physicist Gerd Ganteför uh, in his latest book Das Rätselhafte Gewebe unserer Wirklichkeit und die Grenzen der Physik in English The Mysterious Fabric and Reality and the Boundaries of Physics um, he talks about the conservation of quantum information and that this might also be true with respect to information in general. And then this would of course lead to uh, the consequence that nothing can get lost, everything is conserved and even if we die something of us would remain. So you can really see how this analysis of the void starts to take you always into this uh, realm of spirituality. And I want to move on and uh, discuss what Erwin Schrödinger said. He is also a famous physicist and he was quoted in the book Quantum Questions, which uh, Ken Wilber edited. And um, Schrödinger is referring to ancient wisdom from India. Uh, just like, for instance, the Chinese wisdom is that the great void is full of qi, of energy. Let's see what uh, the wisdom from India has to say. And so Schrödinger says, the profound rightness of the basic conviction in Vedanta, it is not possible that this unity of knowledge, feeling and choice, which you call your own, should have sprung into being from nothingness at a given moment not so long ago. Rather, this knowledge, feeling and choice are essentially eternal and unchangeable and numerically one in all men, excuse me, nay, in all sensitive beings. You and all other conscious beings as such are all in all. So what he is saying is that all these different aspects that refer to us, so he's giving us the personal perspective here, they cannot just uh, come into existence like this. He says there is a time and space independent level where all these aspects on an abstract level are already there. And he also talks about the fact that reality is one wholeness, so we are all part of this one wholeness, okay? And then so he goes on to say, hence this life of yours which you are living is not merely a piece of the universe, you know, this can be a piece here, this unity concept, but is in, certain, in a certain sense the whole. Only this wholeness is not so constituted that it can be surveyed in one single glance, okay? And you probably can understand right away what he means. If you unify everything, which this equation allows, into this integrated concept of uniform uh, unity, then you can't see anything. You need this binary configuration to play out, like in the visible universe, and then you can, for instance, if you call yourself this local entity here, then you can relate yourself to the infinity, the globe rest, and you can start uh, seeing things and understanding things. So, Schrodinger goes on to say, this, as we know, is what the Brahmins express in that sacred mystic formula, which is yet so simple and so clear. Tat vam asi, this is you. Okay, so this refers to this uh, binary concept of wholeness which we are exposed to in the visible world that we find ourselves in. And then Schrödinger goes on to say, or again in such words, words as I am the East and the West, I am below and above, I am this whole world. For eternally and always there is only now, and the same now, the present is the only thing that has no end. And so again he circles back to this concept that there is this um, sameness level, which is time and space independent, so this is always now, it's always the same thing, and which again tells us that the whole universe is always one integrated concept of unity. You will find this also in other parts of the world, for instance, in the Jewish tradition, 
in the Old Testament, God introduces himself to Moses as I am that I am. It's again a statement of, of local symmetry. And of course, this always leads us into this realm uh, of spirituality. Newton gave us the big picture and Schrödinger, he was talking about this personal experience in a very beautiful fashion, I think. And one more quote from a famous physicist, Max Planck. It's from his interview in The Observer in 1931 and he said, I regard consciousness as fundamental and we can understand why. I was talking about this before. Local symmetry is a relationship concept which is essentially eternal. It exists beyond space and time and this uh, relationship tells us that these aspects are aware and there is a, a wholeness awareness of the whole, so this is consciousness. And one more aspect about this uh, aspect of religion, religion and religious feeling, I want to quote Einstein here. Uh, it's it's uh, from the book The Human Side, which was written by Tukas and Hoffmann. And Einstein said, if something is in me that can be called religious, then it is the unbounded admiration of the structure of the world as far as science can reveal it. And local symmetry is really this structure uh, that, uh, that science was able to reveal. We cannot go any further uh, as it, it looks because of the in infinity term, because, so there's always something mysterious there. So let me close this talk by giving you two more quotes from Albert Einstein about this beautiful mathematical structure. As this one refers to his time when he to the time when he was a young boy. He said it to the Princeton High School reporter Henry Rousseau. Einstein said, as a boy of twelve years making my acquaintance with elementary elementary mathematics, excuse me, I became more and more convinced that even nature could be understood as a relatively simple mathematical structure. Later on in nineteen thirty three, as a celebrated uh, physicist, he said in his lecture on the method of theoretical physics, based on our experiences so far, we have reason to be confident that nature is the realization of the simplest conceivable mathematical concept. And it's really wonderful to see that as a young boy, he already sensed that nature is a simple mathematical structure. Then on his uh, scientific journey, he started out with symmetry and it's always local symmetry being his guiding star. And his great success then was when he was able to demonstrate that local symmetry is actually nature's, it is to say the cosmos' central principle. This concludes my talk for today. I hope you enjoyed it. You can always subscribe to my channel, activate the notification bell. This is spectacular fun and I hope to see you next time. Bye bye.